and, and thank you all for, for coming out in the cold. Uh, and, and welcome to those who are listening online as well. So I, I am a native Western New Yorker. Um, I do travel around quite a lot around the country. And oftentimes when I go to sites, you know, you meet a new person. And the first thing that you start talking about is, oh, where are you from? And whenever I say that I'm from Buffalo, I always get this like really sad, like, oh, like I'm, I'm so sorry that that's where you're from. Uh, and it really is a strange kind of kind of thing that we that we get from from other people around the country. Uh, and, and I kind of feel like that also has given us somewhat of a, a low self-esteem in some ways. And, and I thought, you know, we really are, live in a very, very special place. And there are so many things that have happened here for the first time or, you know, really, really close to being the first time that I thought, you know, it would be nice to put together a, a presentation to kind of look at some of the firsts that have happened in Western New York. And as I started putting this together, I started going down quite a few rabbit holes and realized how many firsts have happened here in the area. So much so that I just had to stop looking because my presentation was getting so long. So maybe there's going to be a part two at some time, but un until that time, so to, to just talk about some of the topics that I will talk about today, and again, this isn't all of them, but this is just really what, what I'm going to talk about today. So the Gilded Age. So the Gilded Age is really when Buffalo was kind of at its peak. And because of that, a lot of firsts happened during that time period. So I'll talk about the Gilded Age. Uh, transportation, we have so many firsts in transportation, even I'm not even going to get to half of them. That's how many there are in transportation. I figured I'd throw in some black history, um, some sports and leisure, uh, some women in history, and then we'll end in food and drink. And then we can head off and go have lunch. So again, when, when you usually talk about West New York and you ask anybody around the country, well, what do you think about when you think about Buffalo? What is the first thing you think about? The same thing that we think about this morning. Yeah, so so this is their impression of Buffalo. <laughs> Pretty much 365 days out of the year. They just think it snows here all year long. And they think that we randomly just have Buffalo just walking around the streets. Um, neither of those things are correct. In fact, Buffaloes were never even native to this, this part of the country. But that's pretty much what people think. So I'm like, okay, well, we have to have quite a few firsts when it comes to snow. And I started looking this up and I'm like, okay, so we must have the most snowfall you know, ever recorded in a place in the US. No, no. Or, well, maybe the, the most snowfall over a 24 hour period of time. No, no. Well, maybe the most snowfall in New York State. No, um, we're, we usually come in fourth or fifth with that. Uh, Syracuse is usually higher, Watertown, Rochester. Um, I, obviously, Erie PA is in, in New York, but they get more snow than us. So even that, we can't, we can't win. <laughs> thing that, that most people think of. How about the most snowfall over a two or three day period of time with some of our wonderful blizzards? No. no. How about the most, most snowfall in a month? No. Well, we don't get any of these. So we don't even win at what we thought we were winners at. So I tried to look at, well, is there, is there something regarding snow that we can be considered number one at? And I did find one thing. So we were in the Guinness Book of World Records for having the largest ice maze ever created. So this was an ice maze made in uh, February 26th of 2010. It was at the Buffalo Powered Egg Festival. It was 84 feet wide and 151 feet long. It had six foot high walls. It had over 2,000 blocks of ice in it weighing approximately 300 pounds each. Sounds pretty impressive. Unfortunately, we no longer have this record either. We lost it to a place in Alaska that now has the largest ice maze. Um, So, in fact, we don't even really have winter festivals anymore. And why is that? Because we don't get enough snow. 
you know, we get lots of snow over these very short periods of time, and then in a couple of days it all melts. So it's really difficult to kind of schedule a specific winter festival because we just don't know if we're going to have snow or not. So let's come back to Buffalo. What really put Buffalo on the map is between 1817 and 1825, the Erie Canal is built. And even the Erie Canal is something special. So it was 363 miles long from Albany to Buffalo. It was the largest artificial waterway that was uh, ever made. It was the largest public works project in North America. Uh, it's still considered one of the greatest engineering marvels of the modern world. And it changed travel from New York City to Buffalo from two weeks to five days. And it also lowered the freight rate 90%. So suddenly you had all this possibility of commerce coming through Buffalo at a very quick rate. With that, the first grain elevators anywhere in the world are built right here in Buffalo in 1842, and we still have quite a few of these that are up in, in downtown. By 1855, we were the largest grain port in the world. We had 13 different train companies coming through Buffalo, which made us the second busiest railroad city in the U.S., just behind Chicago. And in 1895, we were the largest um, port in the world for flour, for wheat, for coal and second in lumber. And you have to think that this is a pretty impressive considering because of our weather, our port was only open approximately 264 days out of the year. So we are missing almost 100 additional days and we are still the largest in many of these areas, which is pretty impressive. Now with this brings tons of money coming through Buffalo and we become an extremely wealthy city. So much so that we are uh, have the largest amount of millionaires in one square mile than anywhere else in the world. It was called Millionaire's Mile along Delaware Avenue, which is where many of those mansions are. And so this brings about the Gilded Age. Uh, so the Gilded Age, depending on who you ask, some people say it starts right after the Civil War, Many people give the date about 1877, and some people say it goes till 1900. I think it goes till like pretty much the start of, of World War I, when the modern age really begins. But this is a time when you have so much money and um, technology kind of springing up in America. Um, there are quite a lot of, of wealthy people. Uh, there are also quite a lot of lower class people that are just trying to make some money, uh, very much have its have nots, which we can kind of even relate to even to this day. Um, but so you have Millionaire Row, and I figured I would just throw one of the many mansions that were built in Buffalo at the time. Um, this is the Clement Mansion on Delaware Avenue. Does anybody know where this is? It's, it's where the Red Cross is and the BPO offices are also in this building. I figured I would throw this mansion up there because this mansion is famous for having the very first elevator for people anywhere in the world in a private house. So before that, private houses would have elevators in it, but they were usually dumb waiters that were just bringing supplies up and down between floors. This is the first one that was specifically had an elevator for people in a private house going up and down. So again, that kind of gives you the idea of what kind of um, wealth we had. And with this, quite a lot of buildings and architecture are being built. So, tallest building in the world? Well, not quite. So the Guarantee Building was the tallest building in Buffalo. Um, it was a sister building to uh, the Wainwright Building, which is in St. Louis, which was considered the tallest building in the world. Um, it is considered uh, one of the first steel-supported curtain wall buildings. What that means is if you think about how buildings are built today, 
they have those steel beams that are kind of the framework of the building and then they fill it in with with the walls and the windows and that's pretty much what happened here and, and they filled it in with this beautiful terracotta on the outside of it and at the time so many skyscrapers are starting to be built that at this time the tallest building in the world kept on shifting between buildings almost on a daily basis depending on how fast the workers were working but uh but the guaranteed building was the tallest building in buffalo and at maybe a, a 10 minute period of time was the tallest building in the world where is that one again where is that i mean where where is the guaranteed building um it's the it's called the prudential building it's been called a few names it's down on what is that Fort and center, maybe. Um, it's right by the old, kind of across the street from the old city hall, uh, by the police headquarters is over there at that corner too. Is that the tall, tallest building, that building tall? It is no longer the tallest building, yeah. that is Seneca, Seneca Tower is the tallest building today. So the largest office building in the world was built in Buffalo, and that is what we call the Ellicott Square building. So it was 10 stories high, but it had enough support and capacity to add an additional 10 stories onto it, which they never did. Uh, but it was the largest office building at 500,000 square feet, and it was the largest office building for 16 years after it was built. So again, to think about that, so this is 1896. So think about another 16 years, you're going to about 1910. And you think about how big New York City was booming, to think that we had the largest office building in the world at that time is, is pretty amazing. I also uh, am fascinated by this building because um, I, I am a major film fanatic. And this building is famous for having the very first uh, room that was built in here specifically to show movies. So in, um, was it March? June 8th of 1896, the Edisonian Hall was built. Now, I'm not saying that this is the first place that ever showed movies, because movies were being shown quite often already in, in many of the vaudeville halls. Uh, but this is the first space that was specifically built to show movies anywhere in the world. Where they filmed the natural. Uh, they did film part of the natural in that building, yes, yes. So a couple different hotels I wanted to talk about. So the Niagara Hotel was built in 1887. Uh, this was on uh, Porter Avenue, it is no longer there. Uh, George Lewis was the proprietor and in that building was the very, very first palm room a palm room was kind of like a greenhouse. They usually had uh, glass ceilings atop of it, and they would literally fill the space with palm trees. And this became such a big hit that you weren't an important hotel unless you had a palm room in it. So many of the famous hotels in New York City, the Carlton, the Ritz, all had to have palm rooms in it. But the first one was in the Niagara Hotel in Buffalo. The first reinforced concrete structure, 1897. That was in the uh, Hotel Greystone, Greystone, which is on south of Johnson Park. It is now an apartment loft. It is still there, and the exterior of it looks pretty much the same. Uh, but this was the first reinforced concrete structure built in America. Um, this is really close to is right off of Delaware Avenue, close to, um, oh, what is the? Channel 2. Channel 2, kind of across the street from Channel 2. It's also Delaware North. Is, there are many structures down there, too. The Statler Hotel, built in 1905. Now, if you look at this picture, you're like, well, that doesn't look like the Statler Hotel. <laughs> Because this is the first Statler Hotel. The Statler Hotel that we, that we think about in downtown Buffalo was the second one that was built. 
This one was actually built on the corner of uh, Swan and Washington Street. So this is where the baseball stadium is today. But Statler was famous for adding new amenities to his hotel rooms, which is what kind of made him so popular. So this was built in 1905. The second Statler Hotel was completed in 1923. That's the one that's on Delaware Avenue that we think about. Um, and that was called the Hotel Statler. Well, now you're confusing people between the Statler Hotel and the Hotel Statler. <laughs> so eventually he just changes the name of this to the Buffalo Hotel. So that is what it eventually is known as. But so for a couple of the amenities, so this was the first hotel that had a private bathroom and bathtub in each room. And you think, well, that's really strange. Up until this time, most hotels would have a bathroom or a bathtub or a hallway, and you shared that with every single room in that hall. Oof. <laughs> it was the first uh, hotel that had a shower and a bathtub in some rooms, so now you have the option of having a shower as well. The first hotel to have a wall light switch for each room. Before this time, there was just an on switch for all the lights in that room and an off switch. So if you have somebody sleeping and somebody awake, you had to figure out what you're going to do there. It was the first hotel to have a closet light. You could see in your closet. First hotel to have hot and cold water in each bathroom. Usually just had really cold showers. The first hotel to have an electric lamp on a desk in each room. And then the one that I find interesting, the first hotel to have a radio in each room. And one of the first times I did this presentation, I actually had a person in the audience that collected radios from old Buffalo hotels. And he says, I actually have a radio from this hotel. And he said, what's interesting about it was, it wasn't what, just a radio that you just turned on and turned off. It was coin operated. So to actually turn the radio on, you had to put a coin in there to actually turn it on. So you had to pay, even though it was there, you had to pay a little extra money for it. So a couple other firsts in Buffalo happening around the time. This is the first place that had a charity organization society. So the first time they're really kind of putting together uh, an organization in which to raise money specifically for charities. And they believe that this is kind of where the idea of social work comes into play. The first library in America to use the Dewey Decimal System was the Buffalo Public Library. See, you say that to kids now and they have no idea what you're talking about. Well, you, you say books to kids and you say have no idea what you're talking about. The first place in America to have a daycare center in 1881. This was on, it was at 159 Swan Street uh, and it was just demolished in 1998, not that long ago. The first place to have a garbage reduction plant, 1886. And the first uh, place in America to have public bathhouses in 1897. So I'm, I'm finding all of these first, and since I grew up just down the street in the Buffalo, in the, in the DPU Lancaster area, uh, well, I wonder if there was any firsts in, in Lancaster and DePew. And I did find that at this time during the Gilded Age, DePew was actually in the Guinness Book of World's Records for something. Railroad. Oh. You'd think railroads. What was that? <laughs> They had the most bars per capita <laughs> in America. Well, here is something to be proud about, huh? And it's mainly because the railroads came through the pew so much. So they would do their work in Buffalo, and as they were heading back, they would stop in the pew and they, they'd go have a drink. So, what year is that? Uh, it's right at the turn of the century, so like 1900, 1901. And also, really, what kind of put that, uh, Buffalo on the map after the Erie Canal is, of course, uh, the Pan American Expo and just electricity. So we're one of the first major cities in the world to get electricity from uh, hydropower plants from Niagara Falls. And with that, 
Uh, we are known as the City of Lights. This is prior to even Paris being known as the City of Lights. So, so it really was something special. Does anybody know what the first use of electricity from the power plant was used for? Street lights. Street lights. Street lights. Street lights. Street lights close. I missed a slide here. I'm going to go back. So a couple other firsts with electricity. So uh, August 7th, 1881, George Leonard Smith. Ever heard of that name before? So he is infamous for being the very, very first person. First of all, his problem was he was probably hanging out in the pew at the time. <laughs> he, got electric. he had a couple drinks. He found his way into one of the power plants and he decided to put his hands. <laughs> oh, that was... Didn't go well. <laughs> so George Leonard Smith is famous for being the first person in the world to be accidentally electrocuted by electricity. How about William Helmer, 1889? Infamous for being the first person killed in the electric chair. Now, uh, the electric chair was actually invented by a Buffalonian, uh, actually a dentist from Buffalo. I, I'm happy I didn't go to him for, <laughs> for my teeth here. So uh, a Dr. Alfred Southwich, uh, he invented the electric chair and or William Helmer was the first person that was electrocuted by it. So transportation, move on to this subject. So back to my question, here was my question earlier. The first use of electric power from Niagara Falls wasn't street lights, it was actually street cars. So the first street car line in Buffalo were using electricity, November 15th, 1897. I kind of like this picture, this was one of the last streetcars that were still being pulled by a horse. I'm a little concerned about this picture. If you look a little bit closer, you can see where this line is actually going to. Oh, it doesn't look like my, my pointer works on the screen. So if you can read right up on top here, it says the insane asylum. <laughs> I don't know who they were actually taking out on those streetcars. At that time, but it almost even looks like it's hard to tell, but it's at the Richardson complex right in the background then, there. And then underneath Buffalo Street Railroad Company, it says Niagara Street to the International Bridge. So let's talk about some, some transportation. So the first automobile in Buffalo, 1897. This is not the first car in the country. This is just the first one in Buffalo. A Dr. V. Montpierce. No relation to the Pierce cars. Uh, he was actually, actually a proprietor of the World's Dispensary uh, Medical Association. And I actually had somebody in one of my presentations that is a descendant of uh, Pierce. And they said they, they actually have a small little museum in their family of all some of the old medical things that, that Dr. Pierce would put together. And it was kind of like, kind of sounded like he was one of those, you know, snake doctors. Uh, you know, if you needed a cure for balding or for your stomach ache or whatever, he would, he would whip together something good for you to take. And obviously he was doing quite well to afford the first uh, automobile in Buffalo. The first automobile insurance policy in the world was issued right here in Buffalo. And it was to uh, Dr. Mort, uh, Thomas Martin, on February 27, 1898, the policy cost $12.25, which is what I think I pay on an hourly basis for car insurance today. Uh, it was, uh, so in today's dollars, it would be about $316. Uh, it, he had a $5,000 liability coverage. And interesting enough is why he actually needed this car insurance because there were only approximately 4,000 car, 4, cars in America at this time. So it was very unlikely that he was going to hit another car. What he was probably worried about was hitting a horse. 
because there were 18 million horses in the country at that time. So that was probably more he was covering himself that, that he didn't hit a horse. And if anybody has had the, the, the sorry uh, accident of hitting a deer, you know how much damage an animal can, can do to your car. Another interesting fact I found, Buffalo had the very first electric vehicle ever used for postal service. Huh. It was uh, July 2nd. Anybody want to guess the year? 1910. 1910. Too bad. 1899. You think there were electric cars back then? Yes, there were. That was before the gas companies kind of started taking over and said, the only way you can drive a car is with gas. So um, it's uh, the superintendent of city deliveries used this electric car to collect mail from 40 different boxes. It took an hour and a half, which sounds like a long time for collecting from 40 different mailboxes, but it was less than half the time that the, the car carriers were using on either foot or horse. So. Couple of the transportation first, the first motorcycle in the world. Who knew? Happened here in Buffalo. Company was credited to a Clarence Becker who invented the auto buy. Uh, it was an early model, it was created in 1900. It became available to the public in 1901. By 1903, the company was the largest manufacturer of sing cylinder air cooled engines. By 1904, the model had a 2.5 horsepower uh, single cylinder engine and could reach speeds of 35 miles an hour. By 1905, one of the company's directors established a new record for transcontinental crossing of the US in 48 days using the motorcycle made in Buffalo. Now here's another weird one. The very first aviation organization was here in Buffalo. Why? Who knew? So the Aero Club of Buffalo was incorporated March 21st of 1910. This is approximately six years after Wright's first flight. So you're like, well, why here in Buffalo? Who knew? Uh, many of these airplanes, these early airplanes, were actually being created by, by the people who had bicycle shops. So even the Wright brothers had a bicycle shop, and it was kind of an offshoot of that. Um, and um, at A. L. Fitzer, or Fitzner, uh, built a Curtis airplane factory in Hammondsport, New York, uh, and he was the first successful monoplane in America. And with that, the Aero Club decided to invite Fitzer to come to Buffalo to kind of show off his plane. And this is a picture of the first, uh, first airplane flight in Buffalo that happened April 2nd of 1910. Uh, he flew it at the Country Club Polo Field at Maine and Bailey. And I believe there is a golf course there. I think that's the, is that the Grover right. Cleveland Golf Course? So that is where the first Buffalo airplane flight was. <clears throat> uh, he had three, uh, three short um, air flights. The first two were very successful. Uh, the third one had some damage to the wheel, so they decided not to, not to fly anymore. But it's interesting that uh, the first air flight was on a golf course here in Buffalo. To go along with that, the first parachute production in the world happened here in Buffalo. This is also an interesting story. So Leslie Irvin, um, born in Los Angeles, California. He made his first parachute jump at the age of 14. I'm not quite sure where his parents were at the time. <laughs> and he ended up becoming a, a, a stunt, a, a stunt pilot uh, for, for the films, for movies. He eventually moves out to the East Coast, and he wants to try to develop a way to, um, to create parachutes in which uh, they are manually operated by the jumper. 
prior to that time was just you jump out and the parachute would open up. You hope. Mm -hmm. uh, so he created a, a, a prototype uh, on a borrowed sewing machine from Buffalo, and he demonstrated his silk version in April 1919 in Dayton, Ohio. And he was originally, and he was immediately awarded a military con, uh, contract by the U.S. Army. In uh, June of 1919, the Irving Air Shoot Company was established, and Leslie was only 24 at the time. Now, notice I called it the Irving and not the Irvin. There was a typo in one of the newspaper publications about the opening of the company, and instead of Leslie changing the name to its proper way, he just figured I'll just keep the G on there and started calling it the Irving Parachute Company. Uh, by 1928, 50 parachutes were being manufactured per week. Uh, the company quickly grew because there were very few competitors anywhere in the world. By the 1920s and early 30s, nearly every parachute made in the world was being made at the Irving Parachute Company. Uh, the factory was at 1670 Jefferson Avenue. Uh, it was demolished uh, maybe about 30 years ago, and there's a parking lot there now, because that's, of course, what we need for parking lots. Um, the Buffalo factory ended up closing in 1953 with all local production moving up to Fort Erie. Um, it uh, would eventually change to the Urban Industries in 1970, and then the Urban Aerospace in 1996, Merging with other companies in 2007, becoming the Airborne Systems, and the company still makes parachutes even to this day. The first jet aircraft in the U.S. was created right here in Buffalo, the Bell P-59 Aero Combat. Uh, originally started being designed in 1904 by the Bell Company uh, in Chicago. Uh, eventually, again, this is during World War II. This is very, very top secret, and they didn't want this to just be out in their normal factory. So they actually moved to the Pierce Arrow um, building on Elmwood Avenue. They didn't feel that that was safe enough, so they moved to the Tri Main building on Main Street, in which they could uh, get uh, space up on the second floor. They completely painted all the windows and welded them shut, and they had security around the building 24-7. That kind of gives you how important and how secret this was at the time. Um, but the first jet aircraft built right here in Buffalo. The first helicopter was built right here in Buffalo, also from the Bell Company, 1945. So the Bell, uh, created by Arthur Young, an engineer from the Bell Craft, the Model 30 was developed into the Bell 47. Here is the Bell 47, and the Bell 47 was the first helicopter certified for civilian use in the U.S. And it was produced in several different company, uh, countries, and it was the most popular helicopter for about 30 years. So this is the helicopter that you'd really see around, you know, the end of the, the 20th century. So other aviation first right here in Buffalo, it's not a big surprise. Uh, we were making more airplanes here than anywhere else during World War II. Approximately 40,000 air, uh, aircrafts were made right here in Buffalo. Uh, we had the first in-flight simulator built right here in Buffalo. Probably not a surprise since we had the first jet aircraft, but the first plane to break the sound barrier was built right here in Buffalo. And then, of course, for all you James Bond fans, the first jet pack was built right here in Buffalo as well. So that was just some of the transportation. We have so much history in cars that I didn't even touch on, but... That might be for part two. So I figured I'd go into some black history here. Some interesting firsts for black history. So the very, very first 
black member of a jury in the country it happened right here in Buffalo. Abner Hunt Francis, uh, he was uh, a, a clothing store owner in Buffalo, a very successful clothing store. He participated in the 1843 Color Convention in Buffalo. In 1843, he was also selected to be on a jury, uh, making him either the first or some people say it might be the second African American to ever serve on a jury in the US. In 1851, he ended up moving out to Oregon uh, in Portland and starting up a clothing factory out there on the West Coast. The first black uh, Buffalo playwright, David Paul Brown. So he has an interesting story as well. Uh, he was a, a barber from Buffalo, went down to uh, New Orleans uh, to visit a brother, and while there, he was kidnapped and sold into slavery. And if you ever saw the movie um, 12 Years a Slave, that story is partially based off of, off of David Brown's uh, life. Uh, he eventually ended up escaping, came back to Buffalo, and he wrote a play regarding his, his, his time as, as a slave and kind of the, uh, somewhat of an anti-slavery drama. Now, interesting enough that this uh, was actually written seven years before Uncle Tom's Cabin, which is usually the, the book that most people kind of think of as the first anti-slavery uh, piece of literature. Um, now, we, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of information about this. Uh, we know it was performed at the Eagle Street Theater, which this is a picture of. That theater no longer exists. Um, unfortunately, we have no scripts anymore of, of the play itself, and very little is known of David Brown's life. All that we do have is that his barbershop was at uh, 119 North Division Street in Buffalo. Um, the first... Buffalo Black author, James Monroe Whitfield, uh, wrote a variety of different poems. Um, his most famous book, America and the Other Poems, was published in Buffalo. Um, the epic poem, America, takes the nation at task once again regarding slavery. And this was supposedly one of Frederick Douglass's favorite books at the time. Um, and this is a copy that is in the Buffalo Public Library. So if you're interested in that, you can go. So take it out. Uh, we're believed to have one of the first black newspapers in the country. The Afro-American was in 1895. Once again, unfortunately, we don't have any copies of this that still exist, uh, but it was published on Oak Street. Um, and it was probably associated with the Afro-American Afro League at the time. Uh, I actually, uh, had spent some time working at, at PBS for six years, and I have a wonderful first from PBS. The first black host on public television happened right here in Buffalo. Samuel Woodard, he was a history teacher at South Park High School in Buffalo, and he was asked to give kind of a history program on PBS, and he would do, it was a, a, a two programs every week on history. Uh, happened in 1962. Uh, just a few years after WNAD actually started. Uh, Samuel Woodard is actually known for, um, more importantly, he was the first person to start promoting a national holiday for Martin Luther King after he was assassinated. So he was one of the first uh, promoters of that. Um, he just recently died about a year, a year ago in uh, December of 2022. So he just passed away. So I'll take black history and I'll slowly start to move into sports and leisure because there are a couple firsts in sports and leisure. So the first black professional baseball player in Buffalo, and this isn't in the country, but at least in Buffalo, was Frank Grant in 1865. Uh, he lived 1865 to 1937. 1886 is when uh, he's kind of famous for starting his professional career. I am not a baseball fan, so I don't necessarily know how good these stats are. Uh, but uh, in 1887, as a 22-year-old, he batted uh, 
He hit 11 home runs, had uh, 49 extra base hits, and led Buffalo with 40 stolen bases. Baseball players seem to say that that's pretty good. Okay, I'll, I'll take it as that. Um, in 1888, so a year later, um, the anti-black sediment started to increase across the leagues, kind of asking for a segregation of black baseball players from baseball. Um, out of all of the teams in the country, Buffalo was the only team that said they didn't want to segregate the players, which is interesting. Partially because probably their best player <laughs> just happened to be black. We want to keep that player on our team. So unfortunately, by 1889, segregation happens in baseball, and, uh, and Frank Grant was no longer playing for the Buffalo team. Uh, but Frank Grant is widely considered the greatest African-American player of the 19th century, and he played for Buffalo. The first black NHL player Played for the Buffalo Sabres, Val James. Uh, played for the Sabres for just four games. So you probably don't hear about him much. Uh, I'm sorry, he played for seven games for the Sabres, four games for the uh, Maple Leafs. He spent most of his time down in the minors playing four years with the uh, Rochester Amherst. Um, but the Sabres are tied with having the most black players on a, a hockey team ever in the league. Uh, we've had 12 black hockey players. I don't know if anybody can name any of them. Tony McKegney. Tony McKegney. That's probably the most famous black player uh, played right after Val James. Um, you had uh, Evander Kane, uh, Grant Fuhrer, the goalie, um, Oposa, who still plays for our team, um, Mike Greer, uh, et cetera. The first black swimmer to cross the English Channel was from Buffalo. Does anybody remember this? I remember him on TV being interviewed by Irv Weinstein and Rick Azar on Eyewitness News. Anybody remember Charlie the Tuna? So the first black swimmer to cross the English Channel, August 25th of 1981. Of course, most people probably know this, the oldest continually held foot race in the U.S. Just happened last week. Yep, all those crazy people running around in turkey costumes. Another first, the very first bowling pin setting machine happened right here in Buffalo. Not only Buffalo, we can be even more specific than that, because it goes very, very well with bars. In Depew. In Depew, yes. So it was invented by the American Machine and Foundry, AMF, which is still around in Chictawaga, uh, for first testing in a Depew bowling alley before going to the market. Where are you? Where was this? I, I, I don't know. I'll have to see if I can find it. I'm wondering if it's, it's transit lanes. Has that been around that long? I'm not sure. Of course, we are known for having the first NFL team to make it to four consecutive Super Bowls. And the, the older I get, the more I realize how impressive this feat truly is. I mean, it's, it's really hard to make it to two consecutive Super Bowls, let alone four. Unfortunately, that also means that we are the first NFL team to lose four consecutive Super Bowls, which is also a record that probably will never be broken as well. So, but yes. <laughs> Some of these firsts are not the most, you know, best things to be known for. Um, women in the NFL. So the Buffalo Bills have made some uh, strides in that as well. So eight, uh, 1986, uh, uh, Linda Bogdan was the first full-time woman talent scout in the NFL. And not that long ago, uh, Catherine Smith became the first full-time women woman assistant coach in the NFL as well. So two big firsts for the Bills. 
couple other women first. I haven't found a picture of this yet. But the first female football team, the Buffalo All-Stars, they practiced at Delaware Park uh, October 16, 1970. I haven't found out too much information about this female football league yet. Still looking for that. What the Buffalo Jills? What about the Buffalo Jills? <laughs> well, they? they were the cheerleaders. They weren't the actual players. No, but they're... Where are they? We had them for years. We had them for years, and then they they uh, decided to unionize. And as soon as they used, unionized, they kicked them out. So now we don't have cheerleaders anymore. But the first professional female hockey team, so the Buffalo Buttes was one of four of the first original female teams, and they did win one of the championships uh, in it was right before COVID that they won. I want to say uh, 2018 or 19 that they won. And since we're talking about women, might as well head into some women history. So the first woman to address a national co political convention was an abolist from, uh, from Buffalo, Abby Kelly. She spoke at the National Liberty Party Convention, August 30th, 1884. How about some women presidents? Now, this isn't president of the country, but the very, very first female president of a railroad company was uh, Melodina Jones, is it? Uh, 1916. She, uh, her father, our father, her husband was running the Niagara Gorge Railroad Company and Gulf and Ship Island Railroad in Mississippi. And upon his death, she ended up taking over the company, becoming the first female president. First female president of the American Library Association, uh, Teresa Elmfordor. Uh, again, funny thing is, is I was in a presentation and one of the ladies was like, I went to school with her. <laughs> and the first uh, female president of the New York State Bar Association was Mary Ann Friedman, 1987. First woman to win the, the Spring Air Award, which is the highest award given by the NAACP, Mary B. Talbert. Very, very famous African-American woman from Buffalo who did quite a lot of firsts in Buffalo. First female chemist was from Buffalo. Anne Elizabeth White Carpenter in 1890. Now here's another crazy story. Talk about a life. So she uh, was a native of Boston, graduated from MIT before moving to Buffalo. Uh, she worked in the re as a research chemist at the Shelkoff Dye Works and later the New York Car Wheel Works, where she set up her own chemistry lab. She helped organize the Girl Scout movement in Buffalo. Uh, she was active in the Women's Educational and Industrial Union. She lectured on home economics at Duval College. Uh, she was appointed a consulting dietitian for the Bureau of Hospitals. She participated in the suffragist movement. She worked with George Urban in founding the Thrift Kitchen, which taught women how to cook with food stuff substitutes during World War I. And she helped establish Allegheny as a state park. Just a few things that she was doing. The first woman to win a Nobel Prize in medicine was here in Buffalo. Another interesting story. Gertie Corey, uh, she was born in Austria, went to Vienna for college where she met her husband, Carl, who was also a chemist. Um, late 1920s, early 30s, Europe isn't the safest place in the world. So she decides that they're gonna immigrate to uh, the United States and they move to Buffalo and they start working at Roswell Park. And they wrote or published over 50 papers while at Roswell Park. And the leading author would change between her and her husband, depending on who did the most research for that. And they seem to be very active with really working together. 
Um, Carl started applying to a variety of different uh, university positions around the country. He first applied uh, at the University of Buffalo um, and he was ended up being refused because they wouldn't hire his wife along with him. And as he started traveling around the country, going to a variety of different university positions, um, one a university interview said that it was un-American for married couples to work together. <laughs> he eventually ended up moving to St. Louis, Missouri, working, working for Washington U University, because it was the only, only university in the country that would hire both of them, which is kind of crazy. But before that time, while they were still working at Roswell, um, they were awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1947, uh, and she shared the award with her husband. Unfortunately, just a few weeks prior to them getting the Nobel Prize, she actually uh, discovered that she had a rare, rare form of bone cancer, that she actually did survive almost 10 years after being awarded this. Um, she died in 1957 at the age of only 61. Another interesting first, the first female detective novelist was from Buffalo, Anna Catherine Green. Ever heard of her before? Because oh, be, a couple people have. So, so she was married to Charles Rolfe. Uh, you might may, may know that name. Uh, Charles Rolfe would end up becoming a very famous, world famous furniture designer. Rolfe furniture is still very highly collectible on the, the auction market. Um, but his wife, was, was a novelist. Um, they said uh, she was the first writer of, of de detective fiction in America writing well-plotted and legally accurate stories. And she's been called the mother of the detective novel. Um, her best known is The Leavenworth Case, uh, written in 1878. Uh, and she would go on to publish over 37 books over a 40-year period of time. And again, you can still get many of her books in the libraries or at the bookstore. First female architect, anybody know her? I, was gonna say, I see some people about the Louise Bethune, just had a presentation on her a week or two ago at the Roycroft. Uh, so she is famous for designing the uh, Hotel Lafayette, besides a variety of different structures around Buffalo, including quite a few schools. Oh, and I, I also learned during that presentation uh, that Louise Buffoon was the first female in the city to own a bicycle. Because that was very, very taboo because of the dresses that you wore. She didn't care, she was, she was riding a buggy. <clears throat> Annie Taylor, anybody know who that is? Yes, the first female and the first person to go over the falls in a barrel and survive. First female photographer for a U.S. newspaper, Jesse Beals from 1901. I love this picture of her out on the streets of Buffalo with this big camera. Um, I think I got, she worked for the Buffalo Inquirer from 1895 to 1925. First female director of a major art museum, Cornelia Bentley Sage Quinton in 1910. That's pretty early for a female uh, art director, and this is what would be, you know, the present day AKG. Or AKG, yes. I was going to say I have to remember their new, what they're calling themselves now, yes. And finally, the first female conductor of a major American orchestra celebrating her 25th year. Uh, Joanne Follett. So we'll end with some food and drink. So the first one I'm going to start with is a rather interesting story because if you Google this, you'll get about 12 different stories. 
but I think ours might be the best. And that is the very, very first hamburger. So there's a variety of different stories. So, and I even have a date, September 18, 1885. So this is the, uh, uh, the Menches brothers from Ohio, Frank and Charles, and they were vendors at the 1885 Erie County Fair. Um, they ran out of sam uh, sausages for their sandwiches, and they had to come up with some more meat, so they just started grinding up some beef, and mashing it together, and serving it on some toast. Um, they thought it was rather bland, so they added a few things to it, which personally I think sounds even more disgusting. They added coffee and brown sugar to it. I'm not a big coffee fan, so I don't know if I'd like that. And the original sandwich was sold with just ketchup and sliced onions. Mm. So first of all, why September 18th, 1885? So at that time, at the late 19th century, the Erie County Fair took place in September and not August to go along with the harvest. And the Erie County Fair that year ran from September 16th to the 18th. So the 18th would have been the last day when they probably had ran out of their meat and when they started making their, their, their hamburgers. Now, um, where this comes into a problem is many of the other stories of where the first hamburgers happen First of all, ours is one of the earliest dates, which helps. Uh, number two is none of the other stories can tell you why they call it a hamburger. And the Menchies does have a story, and they said, well, they called it after the place where they were, which was Hamburg. And it's the hamburger, which is why I think our story holds up more than, than many of the other stories. But to go along with the hamburger, the very, very first McDonald's in New York State, November 17th, 1959. It is still there. It is on Niagara Falls Boulevard, uh, not that far away from the Boulevard Mall. Uh, the Boulevard Mall was actually uh, the first indoor covered mall in the area, and they decided that this would be a good place to put a McDonald's. Um, At one time, this McDonald's sold more, the most hamburgers than any other McDonald's in the United States. Uh, the first few months in business, uh, they were uh, selling 70,000 hamburgers, 30,000 bags of fries, and 20,000 shakes. Pretty impressive. A couple coffee first. Again, I'm not a coffee drinker, so. But the first instant coffee in the world comes into play in May 1901. May 1901 is a very important date in Buffalo. Does anybody know what is happening? May 1901 is the opening of Pan American Expo. And the instant coffee is debuted at the Pan American Expo. And it must have been a really, really big hit because another first in Buffalo is we are the first place in the world to institute a coffee brand. <laughs> so this is the Barcolo, Barcolo Manufacturing Company, which was located on Louisiana and Kentucky Street in Buffalo. And the first coffee break takes place in 1902. Another interesting thing for foods. So here's a question for you. We have the most blank per capita as regarding food or drink. And don't say bars because we already covered that in a few. Chicken wings. Chicken wings, you think chicken wings, no? No? Peach parlors. No, peach parlors. The most chocolatiers per capita. Now think about this. There's a lot of places that have much larger chocolate companies. Hershey for one. Paradilly Square in San Francisco. Portland has quite a few large chocolate factories. But we have these small family-run chocolate companies. And I just threw up just a few of all of the chocolate, co chocolate companies that we have here in Buffalo. 
And with that, we have another first, and what are we kind of famous for when it comes to chocolate? Of course, sponge candy, yes. So it is called, first of all, you can only make sponge candy in certain climates. So everybody can't make sponge candy. Um, there's a couple different places that do make it that call it different things. But most people say that sponge candy started in Buffalo around the early 1940s. They say 1941-ish. How about drink? Are there any drinks that are very, very unusual specifically for this region? Oh, I think I just heard it. It is Logan Berry, yes. So this is another very, very strange story. So Logan Berry starts in 1881 by a James Logan who accidentally breeded North American blackberries with European raspberries at his farm in Santa Cruz, California. And he creates a new berry that he names after himself, Logan. So he starts calling it the Logan Berry. It ends up becoming a very, very important crop in Canada. Who knew? And Loganberry is very, very high in vitamin C. And the Canadian government started selling large supplies of Loganberry for rations to feed Canadian and British troops during World War II. So it becomes a very important crop in Canada. World War II ends, and now these farmers who are growing all this Loganberry really don't have a great place to sell it. So the government tries to, tries to get initiatives and incentives for people to make things out of Loganberry. <laughs> and one of those things happens around Ontario, Lake Ontario, which is where the large population of Canadians live. And an interesting, uh, William Kronfeldt, who was a machinist at the Pierce Aero Building, started running a waffle stand up in his, by his summer home outside of Crystal Beach. And this was his waffle stand at Crystal Beach. And he realized he could get really, really cheap Loganberries. And he started bringing these Loganberries to his shop and started hiring all the young kids in the neighborhood to go out into a big barrel in the back of the shop and stomp on these berries, kind of like, you know, I Love Lucy, Lucy did in, in the grapes. And they started making a liquid, which he then started turning into a beverage, which he called after the berry, Loganberry. Well, this became so popular for Western New Yorkers going up to Crystal Beach, they just that was just one of the treats that they would get. And they started having Loganberry. Well, in the 1940s, then local Western New York chains of pharmacies started offering Loganberry at their soda, soda bars, and it kind of became somewhat of a popular treat. And to this day, it still is. You still get Loganberry, but now it's starting to find its way into a variety of different things. I have seen uh, Loganberry ice cream. They have Loganberry beer, uh, not so much. Um, a, a variety of different distilleries are now putting Loganberry vodkas together. Better than the, than the beer, I, I, would, I would say. And finally, how we're doing at that? Oh, I'm going a little late here. Okay, so we'll, we'll end up on what pretty much has Buffalo on the map today, and that is the chicken wing. Of course, where is the first chicken wing? Anchor Bar. So the story goes at the Anchor Bar that uh, Frank and Teresa, um, Teresa's one son, came with some friends late one night at the bar. They really kind of were, were out of uh, the regular meals, and she asked him, well, if he asked his mom if he could whip, whip her up some, some something to eat. She took some leftover chicken wings, tossed it in some hot sauce, and served them to the kids. They seemed to like it. Story goes that the next couple months, they started continuing to make these chicken wings, but they gave them to their customers for free. Why is that? 
chicken wings are really hot and spicy, which means what? You're going to drink a lot more. And sales at their bar started going up quite a lot. Then they started realizing, well, people were coming to the place just to eat the chicken wings and not necessarily drink. So they started charging for chicken wings. And as they say, the rest is history. Now, what if I told you that this wasn't necessarily the first place of the chicken? What if we go back a little bit farther? 1961 to a place called Wings and Things. So this is a man by the name of John Young. Grew up in Alabama. Came up to Buffalo during the Great Migration. And he brought with him all the soul food that he used to cook down in Alabama. So Young opened up a grocery store and began, began selling chicken wings. It was located at 1313 Jefferson Avenue about a mile east of the Anchor Bar. And Wings and Things became kind of the cornerstone of the Buffalo uh, Black community at the time. It was regularly visited by many of the, the famous uh, Black Buffalonians. Uh, Rick James would go there, uh, Cookie Gilchrist, uh, many of the Buffalo uh, Bills. Um, so Young served wings that were uncut, breaded, deep fried, and served with his secret mumbo sauce that he made. It sounds yummy. Um, customers lined up around the block. He priced the 10 whole wings at a dollar. Um, and one of the people that would visit there on a res regular basis was a young teenager by the name of Ron Duff, who ends up making Duff wings, which I personally like better than the Anchor Bar wings. Um, and the shop closely uh, closed shortly after the race rides in 1967. And Young kind of lost his, his place in the history of the wing. It's slowly starting to make a comeback now that um, John Young might have been the first uh, Buffalo chicken wing. Now, what if I told you that wasn't necessarily the first <laughs> Buffalo chicken wing? So if we go a little bit farther back, I'll have another picture of John Young here. We go a little bit farther back to B Pavilion, New York which is just south of Batavia. So in the 1950s, uh, a Robert Reinhardt started making chicken wings covered with a sauce by a man by the name of Frank. Frank's hot sauce. He would serve it with Frank's hot sauce and butter and sold it at a roadside stand outside of his grandfather's shop called the Red and White. Now, uh, Robert Reinhardt ended up passing along this recipe to a mutual friend who just happened to own, know the owners of the Anchor Bar. Oh. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> so what if I told you that this might not necessarily be <laughs> the first so this is an advertisement from 1894. Chicken wings, a nice dish, can be made from the wings of a fowl by stewing slowly until extremely tender and making a puree of peas by boiling a quantity of peas, either fresh or canned, in water until tender, draining and mashing through a seed, seasoning with salt and pepper and butter. Uh, mashing it through the seed, th thickening with a teaspoon of flour in every quart. Wet the flour with cold water and cook for two minutes. Serve on a steak dish. Hey, serve on a steak dish. This sounds like the most unappetizing <laughs> chicken wings I've ever heard of. So luckily, this isn't the first chicken wing story. Let's go back just a little bit farther here. And we'll go back to one of these hotels that we had talked about. So the Clarendon Hotel, so this was built in 1894 at Main and South Division Street. Um, in 1856, it was purchased by a Captain Henry Van Allen, who described this as a first-class, well-kept hotel. Now, the Clarendon Hotel actually ran into some difficulties because they couldn't find enough workers to work the hotel, kind of similar today. So he started hiring women. Oh. 
the scandal of it all. This was the first hotel that we have record of in America that hired women as waiters. And it seemed to go extremely well. But also interesting, um, so, so they would get, I, I actually even have the amount out, so they would get, for good success, they would get six to eight dollars per month. I don't know what that, I, I haven't tallied that to see what that would be in, in today's dollars. But we have a menu here from the Clarendon Hotel dated July 1st, 1857. I can't see it, but I have two little arrows here pointing at the entrees. Fried chicken wings. So, uh, the Garden Hotel actually eventually was destroyed by a fire. But as far as we know, this may be the first place that sold chicken wings. That's 170 years ago. Is there a price on it? There is, uh, let's see if there, I don't think there is a price on it. No, there's no, no. prices. Regardless of who started the first chicken wing, of course, we are known now as the place of the chicken wing. Um, after the Anchor Bar's success, you pretty much couldn't go to a bar in Western New York that didn't serve chicken wings. They say in 1990, 80% of all chicken wings consumed in the country were consumed right here in Buffalo. And I think I probably did about 10% of that. But then something else happens in Buffalo in the early 1990s. And we already talked about this once. And that is the fact that we had a football team that went to four consecutive Super Bowls. With that, you now had national and international um, news companies coming to Buffalo and trying to find these, these you know, interesting stories and well, what would Buffalonians be eating while they're watching these football games? And they started hearing about the chicken wing. And with that, the national media does not call it the chicken wing. What do they call it? Buffalo wings. Buffalo wings. And suddenly, Buffalo, the name, starts becoming a specific flavor. And now you can buy buffalo flavored anything. Buffalo flavored potato chips and popcorn. There's a buffalo flavor, buffalo wing flavored soda pop that I don't recommend. <laughs> but if you're interested, Fiddler sells it. But it's interesting that buffalo has now come to mean a specific flavor, and that is a hot, spicy um, hot sauce. And I figured that would be the perfect way to end our talk. I'd like to give a special thank you to the Buffalo History Museum that supplied many of these wonderful facts. And thank you all for, for coming out and braving the weather. Hope you enjoyed. And maybe I'll be back for a part two. <laughs>